it's really awesome to be here in this situation. I've, of course, preached in this church a number of times before, but this is sort of an unusual one because this is like the first sermon as the Kingscliff pastor. And uh, I don't get nervous very often uh, speaking. I've always sort of thought that nervousness was a sign of self-confidence and self-reliance. And uh, since my confidence, I hope and try to put all of it in Christ, I don't really get nervous. It's not a thing with me. But I feel really nervous this morning, so I think this is a good sign. I like it. I'm feeling good about feeling nervous. It's sort of a new sensation for me. Um, The presentation this morning, in many ways, uh, let me just give a little background here. We're sort of hitting the ground a little late in the game because of the visa situation and the transition with us moving. Uh, We were not able to be here until the very beginning of March. If we would have had our way, we would have been here January 1st, but it just didn't work out that way. Uh, The American government and the Australian government move at a glacial pace when it comes to these kinds of things. And uh, so we're sort of arriving a little late in the game, but uh, it's actually a good thing because the church is already sort of off to the races. I mean, the first day that I landed or the second day, I was already, you know, there at the evolution seminar, and then we're starting a health seminar that's coming up and the prophecy seminar with Ashley on Friday. So one thing that's really nice about that is that things are already sort of in motion and moving, and we can just sort of seamlessly kind of come in. Uh, The thing that's sort of not so great about that is is that I have a lot of things that I really want to tell you, Um, and I'm going to have to wait a number of weeks because we have a guest speaker next week and a guest speaker the week after that and the week after that and the week after that. But the good news is, is that I'll be here for the next several years, so I think I'll have time to sort of tell you what I want to tell you, Uh, and and you're not going to get it all this morning, so you'll be relieved to hear that. Uh, But what I did think would be a good idea, because I'm not really given the, I don't have the luxury of preaching, you know, four or five or six presentations in in a row over a number of Sabbaths, I was thinking, okay, what's a good standalone presentation, really simple, really short, really sweet? And uh, sort of what's my vision, part of my vision for what I would love to see happen here at the Kingscliff Seventh-day Adventist Church. First of all, I want to say right out of the gate, this is a great church. Can you say amen to that? I so resonate with, with Garrett, who's come all the way from America, to stand up and say, first of all, that Australians can be difficult to understand. You're spot on there. And not because you don't know what they're saying, but just because of all of their little colloquialisms and idioms, you don't know what it means anyway. Um, But the second thing I'm more resonant with is when Garrett says that that this church is making his job in this community easier. Can you say amen to that? What a thrill to be able to to meet somebody who knows a Seventh-day Adventist or who's been associated with a Seventh-day Adventist. And on the whole, that doesn't mean that nobody has negative experiences, but on the whole to have people say, hey, that's a good thing thumbs up, i got a mate who's a Seventh-day Adventist, I've got a sister-in-law who's a Seventh-day Adventist, or whatever it might be, and for that to be a positive thing. So I want to be very, very clear about something. I just had a great conversation with uh, uh, Peter Johnson this morning, and I really appreciate him coming and speaking to me about this. In no way or sense or in, in, in no way is it the case that David is the miracle worker or that some you know new dynamic amazing thing is going to happen we're just going to try and facilitate the good things that are already happening here are there things that we can do better i think so what do you think and uh, are there some things that we might want to start doing the answer is yes but at the end of the day whether we're here for five years seven years ten years whenever you get rid of us maybe next year um there are some things that i think success will look like and uh, one of those things that success will look like very frankly and very simply is I would love to see the biblical literacy of this congregation increase. We together on that? In other words, let's get to know what Scripture says. And let's get to know it as a community. Let's just learn what the text says. I love to sing. I love to pray. I love to be in fellowship. All of that part of the religious experience I absolutely love. But I don't want to neglect, and I know Jared is passionate about this as well, learning what the text of Scripture says. And uh, so I thought, no better place to start than right there. And uh, we're going to start with a very simple, simple, simple lesson. And we're going to do so by going to one of the most difficult texts in the New Testament. I thought that'd be fun to sort of shake you up a little bit. Um, Simple lesson from a difficult text. You can open your Bibles to the book of Galatians if you brought your Bible. When I say I would love to see and Jared would love to see the biblical literacy of this congregation increase, part of that is going to include you becoming accustomed to bringing your Bibles to church, right? I want you to think, oh, of course I'm going to have to have my Bible because Jared's preaching. Of course I'm going to have to have my Bible because Pastor Asherick is preaching or one of the elders is preaching. 
And uh, so we go to the book of Galatians, and before we go right to the text, which is in Galatians chapter 2, let me join you there, um, let's set a little bit of a background here. The Bible is a patently Jewish document, okay? It is Jewish from top to bottom, and virtually all of the writers are Jewish writing from some kind of a Jewish context. Uh, there are, of course, exceptions, but for the most part, we're dealing with a Jewish document that's documenting Jewish history and Jewish situations and, and Jewish language, etc. Um, one of the difficulties for us living here in Australia or really anywhere uh, in, the, in the world today is that we're coming to an ancient document that is largely set in a Jewish context and many of us are unfamiliar with that context. We don't know what the customs were or the, the major thinking patterns or the paradigms of the day. And it's very easy for us to take our sort of modern, whether it's American or Australian or European situations and then try to read them into the text rather than trying to come to grips with what was actually taking place here and then make appropriate and responsible application to our situation. Well, when we speak about the Bible being a Jewish document, basically all of the New Testament writers, as well as the Old Testament writers, were Jewish, with the possible exception of Luke in the New Testament, who wrote the Gospel of Luke in the book of Acts. To say that the coming of Jesus, who was, of course, Jewish, the Jewish Messiah, to say that his life and his death, and particularly his resurrection, to say that that had tectonic implications for Jewish thinking would be an understatement. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus literally changed everything for the Jews of the first century that were living in and around Palestine. Now, this would not have been expected or anticipated. I mean, Jesus was not a particularly well-known individual. He's dead by the age of about 31 or 32. He wrote no books. He was not particularly famous as such. And yet here we are living some 2,000 years later and the whole course of history and of time has been shaped by this seemingly insignificant young but provocative rabbi from the Middle East more than two millennia ago. The thing, of course, that sets Jesus aside and, and makes his life so remarkable was not just the things that he said, and he certainly said some very audacious things. We might look at a couple of those things this morning. But the thing upon which it all hinges is whether or not this guy actually was who he claimed to be and whether or not he actually, literally, historically, bodily rose from the dead. In other words, the whole Christian religion comes down to the, to the very sharp, very fine point, the fulcrum of the resurrection. If the resurrection is true, Jesus was unquestionably the most significant figure in all of human history. If the resurrection is not historically true, then he's an anomaly, he's an interesting figure, he might be interesting for you know, literary reasons or cultural reasons or historical reasons, but he's not the Messiah and he certainly isn't the savior of the world. So when it comes down to, you can just sort of imagine a very large you know, plank going across here and the fulcrum is sort of right in the middle. If in fact the resurrection is true, it has the power to tilt the whole of human history toward what this man said and who he was because he made some fantastically audacious claims about his identity, about his relationship to God, and about his mission. If the resurrection is true, it is the vindication and the validation of all of the things that Jesus said. Well, of course, it goes without saying that all of the New Testament writers believed that Jesus was, in fact, the Jewish Messiah. He hadn't come as expected. We'll spend a lot of time talking about that over the years to come. He had not come as expected, he had not come as anticipated, but he had come. And against all uh, odds and against all expectation, he was crucified on a Roman instrument of torture and he rose again the third day. And to call this tectonic, to call this gigantic, to call this enormous, all of these words fall short of what this would have done to Jewish thinking. Now let me try and paint the picture there. In and around the time of Jesus, first century Judaism, or what's sometimes called second temple Judaism, there was a very deep longing for a Messiah figure. The history of the Jewish faith was basically, or the Jewish uh, people, was basically an uninterrupted succession of subjugation to other powers, almost always pagan, or certainly always pagan. And of course, this is much of the history of the Old Testament. You have a subjugation, for example, to Egypt and to Babylon, to the Persians, to the Greeks, and in the time of Jesus, to the Romans. 
Now, this was a very problematic thing for somebody who's a Jew because you're saying out of one side of your mouth that you believe you are God's chosen people, the descendants of Abraham, and the lineage through which Messiah will come. And so you really think that there's something special about you. The problem is, is that your history communicates that there's nothing at all special about you. You're exceedingly ordinary. In fact, even worse than ordinary, you often come up on the short end of the stick in conflicts with your neighbors. The expectation of a Messiah was such that, that the Messiah figure began to grow in the Jewish psychology and in the Jewish theology. When Messiah would come, he would be the best of all possible worlds. He would be a David-like king. Right, David the great warrior, David the greatest king of all Israel. He would, he would have the warrior traits of, of King David. In addition to being a Davidic figure, the Messiah would be a Solomonic figure. He would be wise, he would be brilliant, he would be the one that would speak proverbs that only the most brilliant could comprehend. He would be a Davidic figure and a Solomonic figure, and he would even have a little bit of Saul mixed in, the first three kings of Israel, Saul, David, and Solomon. He would be handsome, he would be charismatic, he would be a natural born leader. And as the sort of psychological oppression from centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries of being subjugated to pagan powers pushed and pushed and pushed and levied its heavy toll on the Jewish thinking, the Messiah figure grew and grew and grew in the mind of, of the Jews. And so he's going to come. He's going to be powerful. He's going to be brilliant. He's going to be a leader. He's going to do all of these amazing things. So much so that you get the, the sense that he would be able to just, with a wave of his hand, single-handedly defeat you know, the greatest power that had ever been, namely the Roman Empire. Well, of course, this sort of governmental, militaristic, national, patriotic picture of what a Messiah would be and do is not at all what we find Jesus doing in the New Testament. We find a young, unassuming, somewhat provocative, uh, apparently uneducated son of a carpenter. Who is this guy? He's nobody, or apparently nobody. He shows up on the scene of action, and there is certainly something mysterious and wonderful about him, but there's nothing to sort of indicate that this guy is the Messiah, right? No indication of his, you know, prestige as a military leader or his, you know, governmental prowess or any other such thing, but there's something fascinating, not just his miracle working, but the way that he speaks and the way that he carries himself and the boldness with which he addresses the religious leaders of his day. He would repeatedly say things like this, for example, to crowds that would assemble. Crowds would assemble with a sort of expectation of who and what Jesus was, and he would say things like, you have heard that it was said by them of old. And then he would say some proverb or some teaching, rabbinical teaching, and he would say, but I say to you. You have heard, but I say. And so Jesus here, in a, in a remarkable way and in a very bold way, and yet somehow also simultaneously in a humble way, was setting himself over and against the religious teachers and ideologies of his day. You have heard, but I'm telling you something different. You have been told, but this is what I have to say. Jesus was radical. He was reformatory, and he was revolutionary. It wasn't only the things that he said. Sometimes it was the things that he did. On one occasion, Jesus had the audacity, the temerity, to walk into the temple precincts to form a small whip out of, out of uh, some cords and to begin to, to chase the money changers out of the temple and in the process thereby to overturn their tables and, and the changes being spread. And there must have been a fierceness or a, uh, you could just sense that you don't mess with this guy. And uh, as he sort of you know, brushes the temple and, and, and uh, sweeps it clean, I can just imagine Jesus there as, as the Gospels portray. He's standing on the, the gates of the temple, and those that have just been recently removed from its precincts are astonished, and they actually ask him the question, by whose authority do you, who are you? Who do you think you are? And Jesus says one of the most audacious and remarkable things that he said in all of his short ministry, he said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. Wow, of course they were incredulous. They said, wait, are you kidding? It took us 46 years to build this temple. Of course, they're thinking of the literal second temple that had been built many years before. When Jesus said, you destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, here he was setting himself and his ministry and his body over and against the literal physical temple. Let me just give you a brief translation there. 
What Jesus was saying is that up to this point, the temple has been the place, the location of what God is doing on earth. I'm telling you God has a new place, a new location, and a new person through which he's doing what he's doing on earth. And, as if that wasn't audacious enough, I am that person. Destroy this temple because I'm a threat to the system. I'm a threat to your religious establishment. You destroy this temple, and three days later, it will be walking around again. Jesus was wild. He just set himself over and over against the prevailing religious expectation of his day. He was Messiah, but he was not Messiah as was expected and was anticipated and was hoped for. When he hung on that Roman instrument of torture, all of the disciples basically lost hope and, and they scattered. They couldn't believe that, that a Messiah figure would be hanging on a Roman cross. If anything, the Messiah would come and hang some Romans on some of their own crosses. He wouldn't himself end up on a cross. And this completely turned the whole thinking, the whole expectation of what a Messiah would be and do and what he would establish whoop, all the way upside down. So much so that the writers of the New Testament and hundreds and thousands of Jews who did not write in the New Testament had to do something. Something that many of you might have to do over the course of the next several months and years. Now listen carefully. They had to go back and learn their own religion again. I want to say that again. They had to go back and learn their own religion again. They had to go back and read their own prophecies. They had to go back and read their own psalms. They had to go read their own poets. They had to go read their own history. They had to go back and relearn what they were just sure that they knew. And this turning upside down, this, this radical tectonic shift from what they thought was the case to what was the case was something that was too big for many. And a great many, not all of course, but a great many rejected Jesus, rejected his claims of messiahship and distanced themselves from him. Some, of course, were responsible to some degree for his actual crucifixion. Well, in the book of Galatians, we encounter the most prolific writer in the New Testament, Paul. And in Galatians chapter 2, he says something that at first blush is impossibly difficult to understand. You read it and you're like, what? That makes no sense. Well, the reason that it probably makes no sense to us at first blush is that we're reading what Seventh-day Adventists think Paul is saying and not what Paul is actually saying. And that's one of the things that myself and Jared and the other leaders here are going to really strive to try and do is to teach you and for ourselves also to learn how to read the Bible, not just as a Seventh-day Adventist, but how to read the Bible as God intended it to be read. Do you hear the difference? Maybe that makes some of you uncomfortable. I kind of hope it does. Galatians chapter 2, verse 19. Strange verse, weird verse. If I ask you to go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, many of you have heard that verse, you've quoted, probably some of you have that verse memorized. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Many of us know that verse. We've quoted it before, we've heard it in scripture songs, we know that verse. Praise songs are written about Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. But if I said, quote Galatians chapter 2, verse 19... I'd be really surprised if any of us in the whole church could just quote it right from memory because it's a weird verse. It's a seemingly awkward verse, and yet it's one of the most amazing in all of Paul's writings. Verse 19, Paul says, For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to Christ. Okay, what? What? Let's read that first phrase there again. He says, For I, through the law died to the well what does that mean well the reason that that might sound like gobbledygook to some of us here perhaps to many of us or even most of us here is that when when we see the word law in the bible when we see the word law what do we automatically think of as seventh day Adventists? what's the first thing that comes to our mind ten commandments of course so when we read that, if we were to insert the word, uh, the phrase Ten Commandments, it really wouldn't make a lot of sense. For I, through the Ten Commandments, died to the Ten Commandments. It makes very little sense. Well, the good news for us is that that's not what the word means here in this context, law. Paul was not using the word law to refer specifically to the Ten Commandments and basically never did. It's very hard to find even a single instance in all of the New Testament where any writer used the word law to mean the Ten Commandments. 
When a Jew used the word law, they were referring to the either one of two things, the whole of the Old Testament, or perhaps more specifically to the writings of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So now in this context, what Paul is saying is this. I, through my reading of Moses, died to my old reading of Moses so that I might live to God. Let me translate that for you. After Jesus comes, he says, after this fulcrum, after the resurrection, and and we have a new biblical picture of what a Messiah is and what he will accomplish, we are reading our own Bible. We're reading our own poets, our own Psalms, our own prophets. We're going back with a new set of glasses and we're reading our own book. And he says... I stopped reading. I went back and I read my own book. I went back and I read my own, learned my own religion, read my own history, he says, and I died to that way of reading my religion. And I learned a whole new way to see Scripture. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God, to Christ. For many of us, we need to do the very same thing. Many of us in this room, not all, but many, were raised in the Seventh-day Adventist context or have been Seventh-day Adventists for a long time, and we are just sure that we know what Seventh-day Adventism means, what what its message is, what its purpose is, what its goals are. But I would like to suggest that to a very significant degree, many of us need to go back and learn our own religion. We need to learn our own faith and learn it again. Many of us are going to need to say a year from now or two years from now, perhaps longer, I died to my old way of understanding the Seventh-day Adventist faith so that I might be alive to God's understanding of what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, just a word on this. One of the things that happened to the New Testament writers when they went back and started reading the Old Testament, they started seeing Messiah everywhere, but not in the places that they thought they would. Formerly, they had seen Messiah in these conquering passages, in the military passages, all of the passages, for example, in Isaiah and other places that talk about Israel being exalted over and against the you know, various pagan or heathen nations. They'd read that. They knew that that was there and that Messiah was going to do all of those things. But there were whole passages, whole books, whole poems that they were sort of conveniently skipping over that spoke of a suffering Messiah and a rejected Messiah and a Messiah who would be humble and meek and lowly. When the New Testament writers, particularly the Gospel writers and Paul, when they went back and started reading the Old Testament, they started seeing Jesus everywhere. They started seeing Messianic fulfillments, true biblical fulfillments of Jesus as Messiah all over the place, so much so that when they went back, it's like they were reading a whole new book. I can imagine that many of them would have have felt like, man, I learned this stuff in Sabbath school. How did I miss that? Man, I learned this stuff. I'm a fourth, fifth, seventh, eighth, ten generation Jew. You know, I've been in this forever and ever, and and, uh, I've known those stories. I've read those histories. I've read those prophecies. I've read those poems. How did I miss the point? And yet, this is exactly what the New Testament describes. That these Jewish writers, again, with the exception of Luke, that they went back to their own book, to their own stories, to their own history, to their own proverbs, to their own prophecies, to their own poems and songs and legacy. They went back and they put on a new set of glasses. And when they put those new set of glasses on with radical Christ-centeredness, they began to see Jesus, the meek and lowly Messiah. They began to see a suffering and a wounded and a rejected Messiah. They also saw a conquering and returning Messiah, but they realized that, in fact, that was at the very end of time. But there was this interim period where Messiah would come, be misunderstood, maligned, and rejected. They had to go back and relearn their own faith. They had to go back and learn what they were just sure they already knew. And Paul's language here in Galatians 2 is so strong. He doesn't merely say, I went back and I relearned it. He says, I had to die to that way of reading the scriptures. I, through my reading of the law, died to that way of reading the law. Why? Because it was Christless. And in being Christless, it was lifeless. Many of us need to go back and relearn how to read our own text relearn our own history, relearn our own songs and poems and hymns and realize that it always had Jesus at the center. We just failed to see it. He had been there all along, but somehow we had missed the point. We're just going to go to one last passage of Scripture here, one last place in Scripture, and it's in the book of Acts. Join me there if you would. 
Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And Acts, of course, is just exactly what it sounds like. Acts is the story of the actions of the church. This is what the church did when they believed the message of Christ as Messiah, crucified and risen from the dead. When they believed that Jesus was risen from the dead and ascended to the right hand of God, it lit a fire, quite literally, the Holy Spirit fire under the church. And uh, the book of Acts is the story of what happened. And uh, we could spend a lot of time there, but I just want to show you two passages, both in, Rome, both in Acts chapter 8. They're very interesting. Acts chapter 8. Keep this nice and simple today. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. It says, now Saul, who of course would become Paul, the one that re- wrote what we just read in Galatians. This is long before his conversion. Or not before his conversion, but long before he would write there in Galatians. This is just before his conversion. Now Saul was consenting to the death of Stephen, and at that time a great persecution which was at Jerusalem arose against the church. They all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. One of the great heroes of the early church has been stoned, Uh, Stephen, this has taken place shortly after the resurrection of Jesus within the first few years, and there's this persecution, this growing persecution that's mounting, especially against the church in Jerusalem, and Saul, who will later become Paul, is a major figure in this persecution. Now, I want you to notice what it says in verses 4 and 5, that those that were scattered, what they did. This is the point. Verse 4 says, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere doing something. You can summarize it in three words. What does the text say? Those that were scattered went everywhere, and what did they do? Preaching the word. You got that? In other words, what would be another way of saying that? What would be a more modern way of saying they went everywhere preaching the word? How else might we say that? Okay, they went everywhere spreading the news. Okay, anybody else? The word. What's the word? Okay, yeah, evangelize, that's good. Um, let's just go through it word by word. Preaching the word. What would be another word for preaching? Just one word. Teaching, speaking, sharing. Okay, very good. And the word here, preaching the word, what word? What, what word do you think they were preaching? Okay, what word though? What, what text are they using? They're all using the Old Testament. That's what it's saying. It's saying that these people who were scattered, they went everywhere with the Old Testament in their hand and they were sharing the Old Testament text. They were sharing the Old Testament scriptures. Now take a look at verse 5. What were they sharing when they shared the Old Testament text? Well, I'll tell you what they were sharing. They were sharing it as they were reading it with their new glasses. They weren't sharing it like the rabbis were sharing it. They weren't sharing it like those who didn't understand or those who rejected the Messianic identity of Jesus were sharing it. They were sharing a whole new thing. Look at verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and what was he preaching? He preached, he preached Christ to them. So look in verse 4. What was he preaching in verse 4? He was preaching the, the word, and what's he preaching in verse 5? He's preaching Christ. Because for the New Testament believers, Philip and the others, all of the New Testament writers, to preach Scripture was to preach Christ, because he was all over the text. They had a new way of understanding their own faith and their own religion and their own things. Stay in Acts chapter 8, our last verse. Acts chapter 8, and this is the story of Philip. And he's teaching a Gentile, an Ethiopian. And uh, he sees this Gentile in a chariot, and he's reading from a book, the book of Isaiah, and he, he draws up next to him. And in verse 34, notice what he says. Uh, so, the Philip, uh, so the eunuch answered Philip, the Ethiopian answered Philip, and he said, man, I'm reading this text. I got a question for you. Of whom does the prophet say this stuff, of himself or of some other man? He's reading there in Isaiah, and he's like, is he talking about himself or somebody else? Now look at verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, beginning at this what, everyone? Scripture, and I told you this is a scripture from the book of Isaiah, so let's just say it this way. Beginning at this place in the Old Testament, what does he preach? He preached, what does the text say? Jesus to him. Beginning in that 
text, he preached Jesus to him. Just like it says there in the beginning of Acts. They went everywhere preaching the word. Well, what were they preaching? The very next verse says, they were preaching Jesus. They were preaching Jesus. They were preaching Jesus. I want to put something up on the screen here for you. When we talk about what's going to happen at Kingscliff and what I would love to be my legacy here and the Spirit's legacy and Jared's legacy and the legacy of the leadership team and your own legacy, I want it to be summarized in two basic principles, two New Testament principles, two principles that were absolutely saturative for the readers and the writers of the New Testament, and that is this. Number one, this church should be founded on Scripture. Amen? Otherwise, what are we doing here? Right? If we don't have some text, if we don't have some document to which we can point and say that's the truth, that's the thing that we believe. And so we want to strive to raise the level of biblical literacy, in myself as well, to better understand the text of Scripture. But what we're going to find is that as the level of biblical literacy is raised, this will not be a diminishment of the person of Christ. The exact opposite will happen. Because as this church and, and other churches become aware of the, the tremendous Christ, the, the, the theologians would say Christocentricity or the Christ-centeredness of Scripture. When we are truly founded on Scripture, what are we focused on? We're focused on Jesus. And here's the thing. Founded on Scripture and focused on Jesus appear to be two things. But in reality, they're one and the same. Because if we are truly focused on Scripture as it was intended to be understood by the people who wrote it the, in the first place, the focus will inevitably, necessarily be on Jesus. Founded on Scripture, focused on Jesus. And I thought I would just share with you a simple quotation from one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a woman by the name of Ellen White, and she understood this principle fantastically well, just as she understood the gospel. This is what she says. Our doctrines are not, what? detached items, just floating out in space, meaning very little. She says, our doctrines are not detached items, which mean but a little. They are united by golden threads, forming a complete whole with who as the living center? With Christ as the living center. When Scripture is understood as it was intended to be understood, both the Old and the New Testaments, when Scripture is understood as it was intended to be understood by its writers and by God himself, we will see Jesus not as tangential, not as somehow vaguely associated with the text, but absolutely central to the text. In fact, we're going to discover that if we try to read the text of Scripture without having Jesus at the front, we're not going to be able to understand it at all. What we want to be is absolutely founded on Scripture and focused on Jesus. Maybe we could say those two things together. We want to be founded on Scripture and focused on Jesus. One more time. We want to be founded on Scripture and focused on Jesus. And it's entirely possible. It's entirely possible that some of us, at some point in our journey over the next months or years, might find ourselves saying, like the Apostle Paul said, Man, I had to die to the old way of understanding my own faith so that I could be alive to the way that God had intended my faith to be understood all along. Amen? It's going to be awesome. It's going to be a journey, but the journey is going to be grounded on two simple principles. Founded on Scripture as our standard, as our document, as our inspired text. And as we've discovered here, what that is going to mean in every instance, founded on Scripture, necessarily means what? Focused on Jesus. Does that sound like a good place to start? All right, let's pray together. Father in heaven, I love these people, and it's a privilege to be here amongst them and just so looking forward to growing with them and uh, growing by them and just getting to know them. Already, Father, you've given myself and Jared and the pastoral team here, the leadership team, uh, relationships with, with many of the dear ones here. And Father, there are others that uh, we still need to develop relationships with and that need to develop relationships with you, not just people in this building necessarily, but people outside of this building. People who are longing for hope and for meaning, for purpose, for direction, for information, who want to know what's going on in the world. Man, we live in a crazy world that in so many ways is spiraling out of control. But Father, this is a place, this is a safe place, this is a beautiful place. This is the place to be, not because we're here, 
but because Christ is here by the person of his spirit. And Father, we want to be a biblically intelligent and a biblically literate congregation. And we want to be a biblically practicing congregation. People who live like Jesus lived, who love like he loved, who talk like he talked. And so, Father, on this journey, this, this journey that uh, this certainly isn't the beginning of anything, it's the continuation of an ongoing thing. Please, teach us what it means to be founded on Scripture, to know the text, to understand the text, and to love the text. And, Father, teach us what it means to be focused on Jesus, to love Him, but even more importantly, to be loved by Him and to know what that means. Be with us, Father. Do something really special here because you're here, your spirit is here, and your son is here. In Jesus' name, let the Kingscliff Seventh-day Adventist Church say, Amen. Amen.